Hey, Jason. Hey, John. How's it going? Going very well. Thank you. How about yourself? Pretty good. Good. Like 10 degrees cooler today than it was yesterday. So. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got an alert on my phone today was going to be 10 degrees hotter than yesterday. <laughs> Exact opposite. Hi. I think your connection is a little bad, right? Yeah, probably. I'm uh, actually still in the taxi. I'll be home in like two minutes and then I'll reconnect. I think my connection might be bad as well, but right now I can hear everybody. My lighting is really bad, though. I realize you can't see me at all. I'm going to rearrange. You're calling from the stairwell. <laughs> I basically am calling from a stairwell. I'm literally under the stairs. I'm at a hotel, and this was the quiet floor. All right. Um, hopefully, we'll, this will work, and I want it to relocate. Just, uh, all right. Well, thanks everyone for jumping on this call. Um, just because this is recorded, this is the vision strategy uh, review um, uh, for CDRA, a continuous delivery and uh, release automation. And um, I added an agenda doc yesterday. I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at it, but uh, that's where we'll be taking notes. Um, what I want to start off with just is introduction, just to make sure we're all sort of level set, uh, what this is all about. Uh, and the first item is just to make sure that we have representation from product uh, development, design, and uh, product marketing. Um, I don't see product marketing on the call, which is a little unfortunate. Um, but I do see front end, back end. Uh, do we have a designer? You, okay, good. I'm like, I don't, I don't know Mike. What's Mike do? I, you, all it says is senior product, and I don't know what it says afterwards. I assume this is product designer. Yep, senior product designer. We also have Payana as well. All right, that was really quiet, but. Um, okay. All right, well, so everybody, everybody's here, good. Um, so then just to, to make sure we're sort of on the same page in terms of uh, definition of terms here. Um, we have uh, we sort of, even though these vision, strategy, et cetera, all have sort of like English language definitions, we have a definition here that aligns them to a time frame. And so when we talk about vision, we've got to be clear that we're, we're referring to like a 10 year horizon kind of thing where we're going to be in 10 years. Strategy is three years, then plan is one year. And then we also have like a roadmap that kind of goes out to three months or beyond. But um, and then like uh, milestones at the month level. Uh, so just to be clear, so when we talk about, you know, these kinds of timeframes, strategy, plan, vision, we know what we're talking about. Um, and then also just to set sort of expectations about what, uh, what the goal of this is really, um, as I'm hoping that the result is that we do update some of the strategy documents. Uh, there's actually several. So this is gonna kind of weave into a few places. It's like there's the actual categories, but there's actually multiple categories that are affected. I've only listed two there, but it's possible that this could affect more than those two. And then there's the stage, there's a typo, strategy page. Um, yeah, thanks for adding that, Jason. Um, the stage strategy page. And then there's uh, the CICD section strategy page, um, which so it'll affect all of these kinds of things. And then there's kind of this open question of whether we should have actually maybe even a dedicated page to hold a strategy for this industry category. I'm trying to use that term to uh, differentiate from a product category um, because we have a product category for CD and another one for release orchestration. But um, I really believe that the, the market or at least the analysts, uh, some of the analysts have a CDRA, you know, Forrester wave, for example. And so they've defined this unit of things, but I also think it's kind of consistent with what people buy. They really want a package of things that together give them CDRA. And so I think it's really important for us to have a, a coherent uh, and compelling vision for that entire uh, category, that use case. Um, and so I would like to suggest that we have a page specifically for that, but let's first go through it and then See what we get to. Uh, the other question then is, are, are there other artifacts? Um, I know that uh, we're doing a, um, a section review, 
which is actually just a review of that same strategy page. So maybe there's no additional artifact out of that, but I know that um, the sections will be presented to the group with an update on what the plan and strategy are. And the last thing I wanted to point out was just, well, actually second last thing, is um, we're gonna be doing a lot of like discussion about what we think here. And I wanna make sure we don't get sort of stuck in an echo chamber and just uh, you know, keep iterating around what we think uh, is really important. My strong suggestion would be to then, you know, have the PMs go out and validate this with customers afterwards. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I think I have an OKR on it now of, uh, um, I want to actually turn whatever the result is of this thing into a blog post and uh, bounce it off of readers and literally even have a survey in the blog post at the end being like, you know, how much do you agree with, like, uh, you know, if we deliver on this, that you would want to switch from whatever you're using today to using us for CDRA. Um, so I actually really want to gauge at a broad level, um, sort of what customers think of the strategy, but, but also at a one-on-one -on -one level, um, I would hope that the PMs would go out and validate this stuff. And then, so the last thing in the introduction is, um, I think I've done three of these so far, this will be the fourth. Um, it always seems like we need to do some iteration afterwards that, um, that we end up actually coming up with some really big changes and, uh, and it probably then needs to be written down and then we can review you know, the newly written down stuff. That would be my suggestion, so I'm totally open to doing more of these again. Uh, Jason, you've got a question? Yeah, it's a question. So um, are there, have you found any kind of, guide, or do you have any thoughts on any guidance for um, single source of truth across all this content? One of the things that I'm starting to run into as I look at like doing the CICD major not repeating myself what's on like the individual strategy pages where it's relevant. Um, and it's actually kind of tough when you're looking at like, well, the stages have a direction page and there's something that ties into CICD, but it's very release focused. Is it better for it to be on the CICD page or is it better for it to be on the release page? Um, it sort of depends on your entry point. So you're probably going to need pointers of some kind. I was just wondering if you've already thought about this at all. So um, it's interesting because uh, these industry categories that I'm reviewing right now don't always align well to different to our categories. I think this one in particular is sort of the most convoluted and that it, like there's three or four different layers deep where it could go. Uh, so I don't know if I thought about this specific one. Um, the one thing I would say though, is I, I would like to see each strategy, each one of these documents be able to stand alone. Like you shouldn't have to read the section vision before you understand the category vision or vice versa. I could easily see it go either way naturally. I think each one needs to be standalone to the extent that you can, you know, have a single source of truth and refer to the other one. Maybe that's okay. But um, I would love to see that the context is clear. Like if I'm reading about CD, I should have all the context I need right there to understand why we're doing that. And then maybe a point or two like, oh, but this also relates to this other thing. And sure, you know, you absolutely link between them, but I should still be able to understand the CD context without having to read some other context first. And then vice versa, certainly at the stage level, the stage level has to stand alone. Again, you're gonna be at some point presenting that, or sorry, the section level, I'm using the wrong words there even. At the section level, you're gonna be presenting that to the e-group at some point, and that document is all that's gonna be referred to, so it needs to be standalone. Um, it does make it a little annoying, because yeah, some of the themes, some of the content might be in multiple places. I would say, uh, you know, dry it up and do an include of a partial if you have to, but. Uh, That's a nice idea, actually. That might, might be able to help out in some ways there. <laughs> it might. Um, all right, cool. So, um, so then just to run through the rest of the agenda quickly, uh, first up, we're gonna review the existing documentation um, and then actually maybe spend a little time just defining what I even mean by CDRA uh, or what we mean, it's not about me. Um, and then, uh, does it look like in three years? I wonder why I put that there. I think this is the, uh, really the next part of it is the why section um, of uh, like, why are we even doing this at all? Why are we talking about CDR? Why is this important? What our customers need? And I've actually found that in all these, that section is one of the most important things is it really gets us on the same page of understanding why we're doing all this. And sometimes it turns out that we weren't on the same page going into it. Um, and then the next chunk is to spend hopefully the majority of time, we'll see if it gets that way, is to spend time on divergent thinking, really sort of brainstorming, um, you know, not thinking about sort of current limitations or time frame even, just like, you know, what is really important in this space. And uh, just to point out ahead of time, one of the interesting side effects of that is not just to come up with great ideas, but that all is important, but it's also just to drive collaboration, 
uh, you know, between like the entire product development team, you know, product management, UX, engineering, product marketing, getting everybody on the same page is actually pretty darn important. And it'll pay dividends later on when you're talking about things because you've already spent time getting on the same page. So that's really important to the divergent thinking. Um, and then uh, the last part is the convergent thinking, right? Where you try to distill it down to like what's really important. And then also where you can start to draw some lines between a three-year strategy and a one-year plan. Like what's important to you now? What's the core of it? And that also means like, what are we saying no to that we might eventually do in three years, but what are we not gonna do this year? That turns out to be a pretty important part. So that's it at a high level. Um, so I'm just, and I would suggest everybody just sort of take notes in line. Um, I know there's a tendency to sort of take notes at the bottom, but uh, like when we're discussing, you know, number two is review the existing documented strategy. And if you want, just take notes right, right there, basically. Um, so to kick it off, I would love to ask one of the PMs, doesn't have to be Jason, somebody to um, maybe just give like sort of the three minute um, kind of summary of, uh, of what our strategy is for CDRA. Actually, I just realized maybe I need to reorder this first. Maybe I need to define CDRA first before we actually, uh, here, I'm just literally gonna call an audible, move that up um, so that you can focus your, your discussion. But uh, so let's define CDRA first. So uh, literally, you know, like Forest Wave, it's a continued delivery and release automation. Um, it's, uh, it's more than just CD. It sometimes we have a category for release orchestration. We need to figure out to what extent that's the same thing. Is release orchestration different, or is that really, you know, release automation and it's the same part? Um, and and even though you know it's got CD in there, I think to our categories there are other features in our uh, product that that actually factor in here. So like if I look at our categories, we've got uh, you know review apps, um, incremental rollout. Uh, feature flags, release governance, secrets management, and then also pages. This is all stuff that's in the release stage. I'm gonna put forward, but I, I really want this to be a discussion, is that all of those except pages are probably really all part of CDRA. Now I know that like Forrester may not include feature flags as part of CDRA. So that's a, you know, a sort of a debatable part. It's not traditionally part of there, but I think it's an important part of progressive delivery and we want to make it part of the conversation. And in fact, if we could help drive the next forest wave about you know, CDRA, if there is one, or about progressive delivery, if that's what it turns into, um, we should, uh, you know, it'd be great if feature flags are part of that because that's actually an important part of progressive delivery. Um, I also, I'm making my little plug for incremental rollout could actually be renamed to progressive delivery to make it a little bit more broader, but. I guess since feature flags is part of progressive delivery, maybe that doesn't make sense. But anyway, how does that sound first off for a definition? Does anybody disagree with that scoping? I don't disagree. I would maybe just add some color that the, um, our vision of what CDRA is, is quite different from what the analysts say, as you touched on. The, um, the analyst version of it is, um, it's like, you know that uh, release management organization that you have at your company that goes around and asks people for release statuses and has like an Excel plan um, of what you're going to do in the command center deployment, kind of like this older vision of um, kind of like, you can almost look at it as like a project manager for a release. Um, automating that kind of project management job that's part of release management. Um, and that's the main area that I think about it in our release orchestration category is the one that cl most closely aligns to that vision of what CDRA is. Um, but the analysts are also starting to see that there's more to it. Uh, feature flags is one that they're actually starting to get a little bit earlier than the others because they see how it enables teams. And they're still thinking about it in terms of like a project management sort of way, but they can see how feature flags enable a project manager to turn on and off individual features as part of a plan. Um, so that one is definitely in there for sure. Um, and yeah, our vision for it though, I think is to take that group out of the equation by um, not necessarily automating those practices that they have today, like helping you build your, you know, Excel plan in GitLab instead of in, um, instead of in Excel or, you know, helping you manually manage blackout periods by letting you see where environments are conflicting with each other. Um, the uh, our vision for that is to sort of automate away all of the necessity of all that stuff uh, and that's where some of the other categories come from like cd is all about that automating away of all of the 
um, the need for those things that CDRA analysts are asking for us to implement. That's a really good point. Um, and it's funny because you know, RA, uh, most of the time RA stands for release automation, but in a lot of worlds, it's not automated. Um, and so the tooling is, is helping automate. I'll also go a little further and say that I think anyway, when folks use the term CDRA, it is a bit of a legacy term. Um, it refers to companies that have a certain set of practices, a lot of it aligned around sort of not automated, this manual release process, but, but just in general, it feels like a legacy term. And so there's an interesting thing of like, do we even really want to go after CDRA? Do we really, at least, well, do we want to ever? Do we want to first is one of the questions, two of the questions. Um, and I want to put forth as a sort of company strategy, um, philosophy, product philosophy, that it's really important for us to go after sort of the modern development team first and make a product that's amazing for them and then consider any sort of legacy differences. And it's really important because if we start with a legacy, you make a legacy product from day one. And like, even though it's a brand new product, like you've sort of built in these legacy things and it's really, really hard to move upstream, so to speak. Um, whereas if you make it for a modern team and then you support legacy workflows, then you at least have the chance of like these folks that are like, they aspire to do things more modern, whatever that means for them. Um, they, they admire that we do this in that right way. And so that gives them a path to that. Having said all that, like a lot of the, the release manager kind of a process is a totally valid process. I don't want to diminish it, but a lot of companies that come up, that they grow up doing DevOps from day one, where they've got a, you know, a team running a platform as a service or they're literally using a platform as a service. And uh, like, they don't have this huge ops burden and and they're just continuously releasing constantly. They don't have a release manager. It's just a shared sort of responsibility with the DevOps team. And um, so I want to make sure we don't go, we don't overcorrect just because an analyst says we're missing X, Y, and Z because that's what a legacy, a legacy workflow requires. We need to support it, I do believe, um, but I want to really make sure that we support new cases. So we have to balance that a little bit. Practically speaking, I don't know what that means in terms of our scope. Our scope, scope is still the same. And what you'll all have to figure out is like what order of operations do we do there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead, but I think one of the things that I'm looking at is um, we haven't had a lot of competition in this space for a while. Um, I'm worried. Oh, and then in particular, like the competition that's there, like the Forrester Wave for, um, for CDRA has a ton of companies in the leader space that are just not really competitors to us. Like we don't actually come up against them. You know, Electric Cloud and IBM and CA Technologies and those kinds of folks are, they're, they're great, they're doing a lot of business, but they're not actually what our users are actually considering as alternatives. But we are now facing competition from Spinnaker and it's growing in popularity. And so it's an interesting one. I, I don't even know if Spinnaker considers himself in CDRA but they're absolutely in the CDs. They're in the delivery space, right? And so I really want to make sure we win against them. And I, and I would, I'm just going to put forth as my proposal is that it's more important for us to make sure that we win against Spinnaker than it is that we win against Electric Cloud. Like if Electric Cloud beats us because of a whole bunch of legacy stuff, but we win the actual, like the modern development teams that are doing all this stuff in cloud native, whatever, like I'm okay with that. Eventually, you know, I think we should still, you know, uh, sort of compete head to head at some point with Electric Cloud and others, but um, but the reality is that uh, you know if we catch the modern folks, then you know eventually the mo those modern folks will be legacy because something else will come along. And but anyway, but that modern part will grow and grow, and that's the part I want to attach to. Does that uh, resonate or not with folks? So so yeah, I think it's really important to decide who our main competitors are, and definitely. I think that it's it's better to go forward with the modern development than the legacy one because that's just a nightmare. <laughs> like speaking from experience, um, but uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of like different companies with different sizes that they compete in like something specific. It's not like as a whole they give the whole CDRA solution, but they give like something specific. Like we touched on feature flags 
So there's companies that do just that. And we're way behind in the game compared to them. Um, so, I mean, we, we also want, I think it's really important that we uh, reach a competitive advantage in terms of the modern development, but we also have a big disadvantage with all the things that were late in the game. And so it's something we need to keep in mind. That's true, but it's also worth pointing out that not all of those are sort of equally important. Like I wouldn't sort of like try to get mastery feature flags before we get, you know, really great deployment to non Kubernetes or whatever. So the For relative sure. priorities are something we should still discuss, but I do agree. Yes. Um, there are a couple of areas that, yeah, that companies exist for, especially as you talk about like release governance and uh, secrets management is exactly one of those where like, mm -hmm. there are folks that have much better answers to that as point solutions. And we need to, we need to be great in those and have it be, you know, a single product solution. Okay. So anyway, right now I just want to make sure we define CDRA. So getting back to it and one of the PMs start with just, you know, articulate in three minutes, what our like, currently documented strategy says about CDRA. Yeah, so we actually don't um, organize it around CDRA at the moment, but I can read between the lines and highlight the parts that are that are relevant to it. Um, let me just pull up the, uh, the vision here. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, so we are focusing already on that more modern development team vision for CDRA. Uh, and we have conversations with the analysts. We're very open about that. And we talk to them about how we kind of take the model that you approached, Mark, or that you described, Mark, where, um, yeah, we don't offer some of these same features that others have. We address them where they are very specific and important, like uh, manual approvals and things like that. We have issues for that we're delivering this year. We talk to them about it. Uh, but um, we are trying to leapfrog the other competitors that are out there in the space and treat it more like Spinnaker is our competitor, and, um, in, but doing more than Spinnaker in that we're providing the evolution of those features. So for, uh, for us, it's a more, um, the, I, would, I would characterize the release stage as like a aspirational kind of target for these teams. Like if you, if you can read this vision that we have, uh, which talks about some interesting things, which I'll cover in a second, uh, and you see that this is the future of how you'd like to do release management, well, don't worry about the little things in, in CDRA that we don't uh, support today um, because you're not going to need them uh, when you come along with our vision for us. But we'll at least make sure that you um, have what you need, like the you know, approvals or, or whatever. Like, we won't leave you out hanging if, you're, if you have a manual process, but uh, we're not optimizing for that. Um, so then the North Star is kind of feed into that. So um, zero touch delivery, I would say, is probably the centerpiece of it. And this is what ties into um, well, I guess a few different things, but the um, uh, making CD more automatic uh, and require less interaction um, is how we see enabling CDRA teams or teams that want to do CDRA to execute in this new way. So, um, you know, you um, don't need a big release management team to understand all the dependencies between everything um, or to gate things for quality. That can all be built into the GitLab process. Um, and um, just be automatically deployed as you go. Uh, it just, I guess, obviates the need for that sort of planning. Um, the reporting and analytics improvements that go with that, um, making master more stable, A-B testing all contribute to making that easier to do. Um, so that, again, you don't need to do some of the more traditional uh, ARO things that we were talking about. Um, On-demand environments is another uh, another one, um, they don't really talk about this too much in CDRA. They do talk about environment modeling within CDRA, um, which is the idea that the state of an environment has some sort of representation in the, um, in the release process itself. So, and basically what the purpose of this is, is if you've worked at a large company before where they have, you know, like a staging environment or a performance testing environment. So you can compare between your environments and say, um, I, you know, I need to know what I'm really testing in performance compared to production and also understand that if the configuration is drifting, uh, that, um, you know, you've added a new kind of box to the production environment. Well, did you also apply that same change into your performance environment? Um, whereas our vision is more on demand and cloud environment kind of stuff. Um, this is an interesting one though, where, um, there are still some companies that are going to be using these kinds of environments for a long time. And so um, we're looking at uh, scheduling of environments and things like that as potentially a feature to have in the product. Um, it's one that's asked for a lot. 
um, where you've got these big resources um, that need to be scheduled and be part of the path to production. Um, we're doing it in a more generic way where um, it could be any kind of resource, not just an environment, but that's one, that's one area where the environments come up in CDRA. Uh, and then um, secure, compliant, well-orchestrated deployments. Uh, I think the big topic here that comes uh, related to CDRA is evidence collection. And this is one that we're really, really well positioned for because we have the single application. Um, TaskTop is probably the product on the market that's closest able to collect all of this data that's happening in the different tools because um, what TaskTop is, is essentially, it's like a glue program that can hook your JIRA up to your, you know, all, all of the different tools that you're using as part of your development and deploy process. Uh, and they'll make sure that information is synchronized across them. Um, so they, they actually have access to some of that data. We have it all in, in an even easier way because we're, we're the single application and uh, we know our own data model and um, it's just so much easier to maintain. Um, so where people are using GitLab, um, then we can build really, really nice features that provide this almost automatically. Um, so evidence collection can just happen as part of the pipeline. Um, it can, we can refer to our own database to see what the state of things were at different points. Uh, and it's really, really nice. Um, the other thing that we can do in this area is, um, like for feature flags, we're tying feature flags to issues. Uh, issues are being tied to branches. And so we have a view of when a feature flag was introduced, which environments it um, was turned on and when, um, what the context was, what the merge request was that introduced it. As long as we have links between these things within our own data model, uh, which we're adding, um, then we can um, present all of this in a way that no other product can. And um, these are the kind of views that CDRA folks are interested in because the um, user that they're thinking of is a human trying to understand, well, what is the state of everything out there? And what do I need to, what are my risks? What do I need to plan in order to get this change into production or out in front of customers in whatever way they do that? Um, so I think that there's a vision of CDRA within GitLab that's similar in a way to, um, you know, that kind of release manager job and helping them automate their day-to-day uh, -day tasks. But instead of it being kind of like, here's tools for a person who has that job, it's like, here's, um, it's, it's, or what's the best way to put this? It's, it's all just kind of available to be viewed by anyone in the product um, because it's all where it's relevant. Um, so if you're looking at an issue, there's a feature flag associated with the issue, you can just see it there. Um, it's not a special dashboard necessarily that's oriented around um, doing a delivery. It's just your way of working has re CDRA uh, embedded in it. Uh, I'll stop there. It's kind of three minutes, I think. Awesome. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Well, before we jump into sort of brainstorming, uh, I do want to make sure we, we cover sort of this why thing. Um, and John uh, originally sort of proposed this uh, the first time we did these reviews. And just sort of even maybe doing sort of like the five whys kind of uh, exercise, but starting with just like, you know, why do customers care? Like, what are we actually trying to solve? What are we doing this for? What problems do customers have? And then maybe again asking, okay, well, why is that a problem? And, and doing that a couple of times to see if we just make sure we, we really understood what's going on here. So anybody want to kick off with sort of describing like, what is the fundamental sort of problem space we're talking about here? I think uh, one way you can characterize it uh, amongst many is that um, if you, again, if you've worked at a large company, you've seen this conflict between the um, change management team uh, that ha has release management and the individual delivery teams that are trying to get stuff out to production. Um, the individual delivery teams all feel like they can deploy. The um, change management team doesn't trust them and tries to build some process and controls around making sure that things are safe in order to protect the business. Um, and uh, I think what organizations are looking for with CDRA is a better way forward than this traditional conflict between development teams and change management teams, where um, instead of it being an adversarial relationship or something like that, it's just built into the flow. Um, from a developer side, I think they're looking for basically not having to talk to change managers anymore. Uh, and then from an operations business side, they're looking to kind of close down that department or have it not be so expensive. So let's move it up a level though. Like what collectively are they even trying to do? Like why does this department exist? What are the developers trying to do with or without, you know, the change management departments? Like 
what is it? What is just the fundamental, you know, sort of like one or two sentence? Like, what is this problem? I would say probably most change management departments and release management departments were created after a release that caused a production issue. Uh, and then they said, we need a process in order to make sure that that doesn't happen again. <laughs> Fair enough. Can you rephrase that maybe a little bit though, of simply like, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, here, but um, like rephrase it as a, you know, what is the, if a customer needs CDRA, why? What do they need? Well, I think, yeah, if I can jump in, I think the, that what we're trying to achieve here is more confidence in the delivery itself. So we want to minimize the risk. We want to make sure that whatever we're uh, putting into production is, is bug free, is, uh, you know, something that we can rely on. And that's not going to blow up in our face, <laughs> basically. Um, and that's the problem that we're trying to solve. And the, the more automated, the, the cleaner it is, and, and the more trust that anyone would have in this process. Perfectly right. said. So that's exactly what I was getting at. <laughs> right. So, um, so ultimately, you know, letting people you know, deploy with confidence, um, and, and confidence comes from code quality, uh, review process, um, security review, et cetera. To some extent, that bleeds into the CI side. Um, but when you talk about the CD side, it's specifically about making sure, or or how is it the other way? They, they phrase it as the you know making sure that security is um, sorry, delivery is is a non-event. Like if it hurts, do it more often because you need to get it to the point where it's like it used to be a big scary event and now it's not. Um, ultimately. So let's kind of step it up one level higher than that. Um, you know, we're assuming that folks are delivering, which generally relates to web apps or SaaS or something like that, but it could be, uh, you know, a versioned a product that you release once a month. It could be, uh, you know, it could be consumed in lots of different ways. Um, there's lots of things, but when you talk about CD, usually it's about sort of a SaaS kind of thing because you don't continuously deliver hardware, for example. Although now you do continue to deliver software to hardware, but um, but the whole point is some folks are like so delivering confidence is one, uh, but I don't know that that's complete. Like it's also just delivering faster. We want this to take less. We want to be able to deliver uh, in general. I mean, it's a little bit too high. It's not quite you know CDRA is not responsible for this, but it's a part big part of just making sure that your cycle time is faster. Um, and then also like the repeatability of it, like the auditability, the provability of it, the, um, you know, we can have a new person join and it's going to be exactly the same as the last veteran did. Um, that's also an aspect of confidence, I guess. So maybe I'm now convoluting things. What, what would your gut reaction be? Like, what's the important part of all that to, to include in a definition sort of of what CRA means for us? or for our customers? I think it's another way to say the same thing, in my opinion. It's um, the reason that you go slow in releases is because you're doing checks and you're doing like due diligence and you're doing um, like maybe a command center, everybody has to get together in person, you're doing extra scans, you're um, maybe even calling a VP and saying, do we have permission to deploy? These things all slow you down. Uh, and the dream uh, is that um, if you can remove all of these extra checks and you can trust the software delivery, then you will go faster. It will take less people. It's like a positive uh, feedback loop. Right. Well, on top of that is also, you know, the, the configuration, the smaller the changes are, the less you have to redo all the setup and everything. Um, so everything that we can break down to microservices or anything small is something that would help the customers deliver faster. And we also discussed, you know, incremental rollout, feature flags, all these things that are different disciplines in order to minimize risk. That's where we're at. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting point because a progressive delivery definitely tries to make things even smaller or make you more confident shipping smaller things. Um, and getting those smaller things out 
into production as quickly as possible, which spinning it another way then is not just about making delivery, you know, deliver with confidence, but um, getting things into production as quickly as possible, you know, like, well, a big part of progressive delivery, right, is even if it's behind a feature flag, even if it's only rolled out to a couple people, it's in production, which is dramatically different than any other version of, you know, getting it into somebody's hands. And, um, and that's a huge part of CD, for sure, is, you know, get it into production as quickly as possible. It's just turned off? Sorry, you were cut off there. What'd you say? I said that even to go to a bigger extreme, even if the code isn't ready yet, it could still be in production, but turned off. So that's right. huge. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's in the main line, and it means that anybody else's subsequent changes, you don't have to worry about conflicts of various kinds. So yeah, that, that's a big part of it. Um, so then again, let's sort of like, why does all that matter? Like, what are people trying to do? Um, and I'll just throw it at least like, you know, cause this gets back to the whole company pitch really is, you know, we believe that faster cycle times are really important for you to deliver value to your customer so that you can compete favorably. Um, you know, the sooner you can react to customer or market changes, the sooner you can, uh, you know, survive and thrive. Um, and that just becomes really, really critical. And then it also impacts total velocity. Like if you can make these tiny steps, uh, ship them, you can maybe be more efficient because you start aiming in better directions, you get feedback sooner. Although again, if you're doing progressive delivery, you may not be getting feedback, but you know, you roll it out to a beta team, you get some feedback quickly and, uh, and you need a CD process to be able to do that. Um, so all of this comes down to like sort of business, you know, it, hopefully it all drives business results. CD in particular and DevOps in general are, are just really critical parts of customer company success. Um, I don't know that we need to go any more deep. We don't need to go to a fourth or fifth why, I think. There's an interesting thing there that um, it's sort of a tangent, but I just want to touch on it very briefly. And that um, some of that um, squeezing every bit of uh, efficiency out of your pipelines is changing a little bit with all the cheap money that's out there and different strategies are working. And, um, uh, I wonder if there's something there that we should think about. Um, not necessarily the changes are. Oh. I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> Orit, are you there twice? Um, okay. Uh, it um, yeah. So uh, so even the guy who came up with Lean Startup uh, was uh, saying that the calculation is different with zero percent interest rates and um, just it's better to spend capital and. Um, than to try and bootstrap and be efficient in that way because you'll, if you have a business that's able to drop a ton of money, then you will actually outcompete and uh, a lean startup type company in that, in that kind of milieu. That's true. I feel like that's taken us in a totally different direction of the conversation, but um, it but is. But if we're talking about lean startup being kind of like the, the iterating quickly will get you better results than a competitor, then it's. It's not necessarily t taken as uh, truth as it was 10 years ago. Maybe. Yeah, that's fair. But I guess even in that case, then whatever you subscribe to, um, still being able to deliver with confidence faster is of value. It just might be slightly different. It's not necessarily because you're you know, doing customer validation, but you, know, you still just need to be able to make small changes really quickly. Um, sure. You know, there's this great uh, example, somebody Sid was using this with call, uh, talks um, a while ago where he was, uh, I forget what the company was. Oh, I should find this. But some company, that was, I think it was like a trading company where they had some bug in the software and they were losing like millions of dollars every minute. And it took them 45 minutes to roll back a change and fix it. But by then the company was bankrupt. Like it just happened to be like a massive critical problem for them and it was unrecoverable. And like being able to roll back really quickly is an aspect of this confidence. We haven't talked about specifically, but like we talked about progressive delivery going forward, but like being able to go back is actually really crucial. And, um, and I know I've seen this before with teams where there's a natural tendency to think, oh, I can fix this in 15 minutes, but I'll have to push back and be like, no, but you can roll back in three. Like just click that little button that says roll back. Like you, why wait even the extra 12 minutes of letting it sit there? Like I don't care if you can fix the bug, like just roll back. 
So how, like, and you can't do rollbacks in three minutes if you don't have great automated systems. Um, and so that's a big part of CRA as well, but that's you know, a big part of the confidence part. All right, so um, I think we can move on then um, to the divergent thinking part. And, uh, and again, the idea here is that we uh, brainstorm, right? So don't shoot down anybody's ideas, build on people's, do a yes and kind of thing. Um, really, I wanna make sure that we're thinking about, I want like a bunch of ideas to come to the table, I, you know, ultimately, but also to get us on the same page. And I want us to sort of really explore a big chunk of the solution space and then ultimately get down to what's the important part. One of the, the side effects of the way that we've done these strategies is like, we've got these themes and as I read through the doc, it's like, yeah, those themes all sound good, but like maybe there's a better theme that we're missing because it's just not on the page. And this is the time to come up with the like, hey, what might we be missing? What's not talked about? What have we heard from customers that are really big stumbling blocks? Or what have we seen from the market that's you know, gonna be really important three years from now that we need to start planning for? So that's the, the idea. Um, you may have noticed I've written some notes already. I really don't want to dominate the common conversation with all of my notes, but when I was reviewing the, the strategy, existing strategy, I wrote a bunch of things. I really do want this to be back and forth, so I'm not even gonna start with mine. I would love somebody else to start with. Like, what do you think is important in this space? I've talked a lot too, and I don't want to dominate either, but I have uh, uh, like, I right in mind. The, um, John, what, John, John Hampton, go. What do you think is important in this yeah. space? Um, stable master. I think that's huge. I think a lot of teams run into that problem. Um, we are, we were running into that a lot, right? Merge trains is a big help with that. Um, that's one of the, one of the big concepts that's on the top of, top of my mind, uh, lately. Cool. That is actually a really good point. Oh, are we taking notes down or you're just typing stuff at the bottom here? I'm going to add yours down at the bottom, but everybody feel free, okay. please, not just feel free, feel obligated to type your comments and type other comments down there. But stable master is actually really a pretty critical one. Cool. Darby, what do you think? Yeah, I, um, as, as you were talking about rollbacks, um, that reminded me that this is a thought that keeps coming up in my head is um, we, don't, we don't have an answer to that really. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, not, it's not something that um, I think is, is really focused on anywhere, but it's, it's like a critical part of, um, of the whole of the whole thing and making it all work like uh i, I always point at that book accelerate um which mm -hmm. sort of talks about all the key things you need to to be a high performing um team and like that's that's one of them um i think i think we I think we address all the rest of them um but uh i would like to see something there you know the product does have a rollback feature right uh no <laughs> i didn't know that. <laughs> if you are um if you have environments, um, actually, I don't even think it needs to be for Kubernetes. Uh, if you look at the environments list and you can look at all the, uh, the previous deploys, there's a button, roll back. It'll um, just rerun whatever process it took to deploy it the first time, it'll just rerun it again. Okay, that's it's interesting. Like, um, I, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't even seen that. And it's, it's not even really talked about like in, and, and maybe it's not, Part of this group, um, uh, I actually don't know, but maybe it's uh, just not even um, highlighted somewhere. So, right. so there's a couple of things that come out of that. One is that we don't use GitLab to deploy GitLab, so you will never see that button on GitLab CE or GitLab EE repos. Um, so, and since those are the vast majority of repos you look at, you're not going to see it. And you might see it on uh, the about .git or the www repo. I feel like I want to pull it up right now because uh, it really should be there. Um, um, although maybe you don't have permissions to, depending. Um, so maybe you don't see it. Uh, so that's one of the funny things. Um, if we worked in an environment where we had like a bunch of microservices and each team was responsible for a small microservice that you actually deployed, you would be in, you know, intimately familiar with this stuff. But um, if you're not, so I'm looking at it. I do see it, redeploy. So it's not called rollback. I did lie then, I guess. It's called redeploy to environment. Um, but if I click through uh, staging, well, arbitrarily I'm picking staging. Yeah, redeploy. 
Oh, no, actually, no, sorry, there we go. So the most recent one is a redeploy, but the older ones, it says rollback environment. So um, I'm not sharing my screen, but trust me, it's there. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can see it if I look at, at um, uh, like the, the handbook site. Right, exactly, the yeah. handbook site has it. Okay. Now, we don't roll back there very often because it's just a static site. <laughs> right. You know, we don't ever have really critical problems we need to roll back, but. Yeah, so I, I guess, does, does release on that feature? Yes. Okay. Own it. <laughs> we haven't updated it since you joined Darby. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's that could be why I didn't, I didn't notice it then. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> but oh, but then that brings up a second thing though, of uh, like awareness, right? Do people even know we have this? If you were evaluating GitLab and said, "Oh, I really need rollback," is really critical. Would you know we have it? Like, if you read through the docs, it's really prominent. It's buried down. As it like, you have to know to click into the list of deployments, I don't even know what this page is called because it has no title, it's just I'm looking at staging the environment and it shows me a list of deployments and off on the right is a tiny little icon. But this is kind of important, like we should make a big deal about this. Um, I, and, and like it, 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 could, it could be, you know, like the, the UX of how you integrate this feature is, is, is probably fine. Like it, it doesn't need to be this huge button or anything like that, but it, you know, if 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 we and this is maybe a question like do we feel like the um, the capabilities described in like accelerate or or you know things like that are all all of those things are as important then it's probably it's probably worth it to call it out as like a as like a headline feature I know on you know on on Heroku that's like a big thing that they talk about a lot is like this immediate rollback stuff right and so there's the marketing side of calling out but then there's the in product side of uh, calling out and I'll, I'll use a different example because it's easier um the the other thing was like uh, on this same page actually is a button for monitoring and you can click on that and unfortunately it doesn't seem to uh, work on the dub 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 because we don't have prometheus installed but if it was i'd be able to see a graph there but um i only see that like it's a actually yeah it's only once i dive in like if i just look at the list of environments, there isn't even a button to you know, look at the, the monitoring for it. For, so for a long time, that was buried. And you could totally, I could totally understand if a customer had no idea that we supported monitoring. Because first off, the monitor didn't show up unless you actually had monitoring. Um, but we then made a top level, uh, you know, we made the operations top level menu item, which didn't exist for years. And then there's a metrics thing. And in fact, when you click on the operations, that's the default page. So at least you can see monitoring there, um, but it didn't exist for a long time. And that meant it was just totally buried. So getting back to your comment, like, yes, uh, accelerate, actually, um, I would go further. One of the totally tangential, but um, I was talking with a bunch of customers a while ago, and I was actually kind of shocked that a lot of them were talking about uh, dashboarding. And they said, yeah, I want a dashboard with these four metrics. And like, he was absolutely certain that these are the ones that he wanted. And I'm like, well, how'd you pick those? I was like, well, because the book Accelerate said those are the ones you need to look for. And I'm like, oh, really? But then he wasn't just the only one. It was like, it was after the conference and like 10 minutes later, somebody else said the exact same thing. And it was amazing how many people were just like, these are the right four things because the book convinced them it's the right four things. And then I looked at it and I'm like, it's actually a pretty good stab. I mean, you could always come up with something slightly different between three and five or whatever it is. But it's like, yeah, I'm willing to sign up for just, we should have those. Like it's a, it's a solid argument for those are the four that we should have and we should just have it right there and everybody should just have that dashboard. And if you're doing a DevOps transformation, this is how you know if you're succeeding or not because you watch all these numbers and one or more of them should be improving. I, I, feel, like, I feel like that book is the manual that so many people use for this stuff as they get into it. Because if, if, if they've not done this sort of thing, the DevOps transformation before, or if they haven't, you know, if they're trying to like get into this new world of like, you know, this is this is the new way of working. You you read that book. This is the 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 thing says. This is how you make a high performing team. And so they're like, all right, I'm gonna do what this book says exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'd agree. We should absolutely pay attention to that and make things you know stand out front and center. Um, Hayana, you've got uh, some, some comments. comments. Yeah, the the last comment you guys made got me thinking. Like, uh, I think we'll be. Uh, a point for improvements for the UX since we support like all those different personas, uh, roles, uh, different uh, companies and customer size, etc. Um, right now, when I think of like CD, like CI/CD, there and, and, uh, and configure as well, it's everywhere. 
So uh, like the, the learning curve, it's, uh, it's a bit painful. Um, and the discoverability of the features, like what you just mentioned, Mark. Uh, so I would definitely see this uh, an improvement point for us and it's something important you know, for uh, moving forward. Yeah, and I'd go a little further and say like there's sort of a general level of discoverability and then there's the sort of role-based discover persona based is the terms we use. But like if I am an ops person, and I know DevOps may blur that line and may you may not think of yourself as an ops person, but if I am an ops person, it's like, well, what do I look at? Like I don't want to be looking at this stuff. I want to log in and see this other stuff. If I'm a security person, I want to log in and see different things. And I want to know where to look and without then also being the flip side of like, but I'm still just a developer and I never do a deploy. So why are you confusing me with all this monitoring and, and other kinds of things? Um, how do we make it easy for each persona to get their job done, but then also recognize that there are hybrid, like one person may in fact have different roles at any given time. I might be coming in and saying, well, today I'm dealing with a deployment issue. So I want everything focused around deployment but tomorrow or 10 minutes later, I'm just gonna be developing a new branch and working on that and I want that to be cleared. So yeah, how do we make that UX? I don't wanna bog down too much this conversation because it's at a really, really high level, but I absolutely agree that it's super important that we figure that out. How do we make sure that we solve these things for different personas? Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, just to kind of wrap this up, I think it's, it's in a way easier for our competitors to, you know, uh, provide like this cohesive workflow and a better polished interface interfaces. They don't have all which is everything that we have. They're more focused on the specific uh, features like what Audit said. So it's a challenge. That's very true. I mean, especially you know, feature flags and things like that. Like how do you weave that in so that it's seamless? But with the point solution, it's easy. You just, you go and you went to a different website. Now it's really cool. But we actually, it's a strength. I mean, it's much as a challenge we're just talking about obviously a strength that we can blend all this stuff together and we can have our monitoring graphs show up on our merge request widgets that in fact everything kind of comes back to the merge request on the merge request i can see oh this was deployed to production click this button and then i actually go and see the, the individual page that was changed i mean that's pretty damn awesome that we can do that um across you know because we have this whole flow um but you know imagine i, I could have a feature flag page you know some kind of widget on the merge request page so that I'd be like, oh, well, yes, it's deployed to production, but like, let's go and roll it out to 10 or 20% or, or even just, I want to know what it's rolled out to. Um, and maybe that's all from the, the merge request widget. Um, so kind of going up a level, uh, what, um, what else is really important? Anybody? Uh, it was about um, the, um, the, the, uh, not a lot of the companies that we actually talk to who are purchasing GitLab um, are necessarily um, at that kind of unlock the maximum potential out of CD phase. And they're more, you know, we read a book about CD or we read Accelerate and decided, you know, at least for our part of the organization that we're going to try and get closer to it. And so uh, we've touched on it in a lot of these, but little things that help those teams recognize that the feature's out there and how to use it to help them. The example that I gave was, uh, how CDRA can be tracked as part of like a value stream map and see how you're improving uh, is a nice, set, easy to understand and core workflow for these teams that are purchasing dev, uh, a GitLab as part of a vision for their company to continuously improve. Um, and so there, there's some really good unlocks in our area to help them there as we develop the VSM feature and CDRA can help them improve. That's a good thing. Yeah, I think given our customer base, I mean, honestly, three years ago, our customer base, you know, we're using it all for source code and, you know, a few people were starting to talk about CI. Now that's a critical piece. And so we happen to find most of our customers are doing CI, but then the majority, I don't know if it's the majority, but a lot aren't doing CD. And so, yeah, maybe we're finding that a lot of folks are like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if someday we did CD? But I do wonder, like, there's plenty of folks out there doing CD, or maybe they've been doing CD without us, but they just haven't sort of embraced it. I think a year or two from now, I would love to have that sort of, sort of shift that CD, I think, is, is the next big pillar or one of the next big pillars, depending, but certainly the big pillar along that sort of spectrum where let's get 90% of people using CI. And right now it might be some significantly smaller number doing CD, but 
two years from now, it's probably like, oh, now 90% of the people are doing CD as well. Like it's just an obvious no brainer thing that everybody should be doing. And that's where we need to get to. And we need to have a product that delivers on that for them, which implies things like, you know, continuing to focus on Kubernetes and stuff, but also making it work for not Kubernetes. Which actually leads me to one of the things I'm sure I wrote it up above. Um, I want to see how we're planning on dressing in, you know, our strategy in our three year and our one year plans. Um, you know, like a big focus on Kubernetes, but then how do we also make this work for everybody who, uh, you know, has a classic deployment environment, uh, VMs or even bare metal or whatever. Um, and this, I know, so Jason and I were talking yesterday and this leads a lot into auto DevOps because that's actually where a lot of our Kubernetes deployment is sort of um, encoded. Uh, release covers sort of like once you've got it set up in Kubernetes, then like, you know, there's a deploy board. You, actually, this is another one, a lot of folks on the call may not have ever even seen the deploy boards because it only shows up if you're deploying to Kubernetes. And it's like, yeah, as it, as it rolls out to each pod, it shows a little block and it, it kind of, you know, changes the colors, whatever. Um, how do we make that work for everybody, not just Kubernetes? And I know there's a lot of talk about um, adding sort of Terraform uh, as a way to get to everybody else. Um, I think Terraform also has Kubernetes, so it's also possible we just switch to Terraform as the way to deploy. Um, but I hope that there's like an API we can grab from Terraform that would give us that same kind of thing. And then like, hey, with one easy integration, we now suddenly have a deploy board that works for you know, every kind of deploy and not just Kubernetes. I think that kind of stuff is gonna be really important. I'd love to see how that factors into our strategy. Um, and I, I think, think that was my first item, E. The good one. The, um, for the moment, uh, we I think traditionally maybe the strategy has been that the Kubernetes is where everything is headed. Um, so as long as we support that control plane first and we do it well, um, that we can then backfill any legacy people who don't uh, come along for the ride. But um, I don't think it's that much harder to add a couple more control planes uh, so that we can. It's funny because if we do something like a Terraform, that sounds like a brilliant way to suddenly get a bunch of control planes. But until we had that conversation, I would have said, oh, well, the next thing to do is go after AWS VMs or EC2. And then, uh, and then we do something else after that and something after that, like you sort of just work down the list, but that's a huge amount of effort. But if we could just do one integration that gets it all, that'd be great. But to get back to your point though, of like, yes, I, I agree that we should do Kubernetes first. So then the next question is, is Kubernetes great? And I'm going to assert it's not. In fact, I was talking with the customer advisory board a little while ago, and I was really kind of shocked that there were a bunch of folks that had embraced Kubernetes. And some of them, to be fair, embraced it early on before we had anything built in. But still, the blunt response was like they had no intention of using our Kubernetes. It was so badly matched for them that they assumed that we weren't even going after them. They're like, oh, you must be making this for startups or something. You're not going after enterprises. And it's like, no, we're absolutely going after enterprises. Like we just, you know, we must have missed something. And, and it turned out that we weren't even that far off, but it seemed like it was really far off. And, and the big thing in this particular case was that like, when you go to add a cluster to a project or to a group, we ask for like master credentials to the cluster. And they're like, we're just not gonna give you that. Um, we can give you you know credentials to a namespace, but like we have a, a master ops team that manages this cluster and they're just not gonna give out master credentials. And it turned out that, and actually we have to vet this, but um, uh, it's like, okay, well, but if we can just deploy, like give us a namespace credential then and let's just make it work so that you can deploy, like at a project level, add those namespace credentials and it should work. But then we've got a few things, and this isn't exactly with release, it bleeds into configure. Um, but like on the Kubernetes cluster administration kind of thing, it's like, oh, like install Prometheus, install all these things, but it does all that install into a different namespace. And so like none of those features work. So how could we make that work where like, you know, okay, I've, I've got a Kubernetes cluster, but I only have access to a namespace, but I still need to install Prometheus to be able to do monitoring. Let me install it in that namespace and, um, and again, this is, that part is mostly about configure, but if that doesn't get solved, nobody's gonna use CD to Kubernetes. And so 
you, this team of people are going to have to figure out how to make that stuff work. My suggestion would be to sort of take ownership for that and make sure that the deployment part, the, the Kubernetes deployment part actually does really work. Um, you know, divide up responsibilities for who gets it done, but coordinate that to make sure that that happens. Yeah. It's interesting. The name of, we have a team called Auto DevOps and Kubernetes who's, this is their entire focus. So it would be a hundred percent. Right. And there's a category called Kubernetes management or Kubernetes configuration, right? Which is where all this stuff happens. But if the Kubernetes isn't configured right, nobody's going to deploy to it. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's a dependency. Yeah, for sure. But I also, it, again, what Jason and I were talking about the other day is like auto DevOps is a script for doing deployments. And right now they kind of own the deployment to Kubernetes and Helm charts and whatever. But I think actually they can push that down and you can decouple a little bit. And ideally you would produce a template for how to do deploys. And then they would just be the orchestration around it. Like this is what the pipeline looks like. This is the auto pipeline. But even if I'm not using auto DevOps, if I'm gonna to deploy to Kubernetes using a Helm chart, I should just be able to say, include the deploy to Kubernetes using a Helm chart thing. And then that would be something that your team would own. And that might be a nice way to differentiate it and to separate the powers. Cause that's actually what the secure team does. Like they made the template for how to do security testing. And they in fact made that first. And then the documents were copy and paste this job. And then it was like, hey, why don't we just put that job into auto DevOps? And then eventually we added the whole templating system. And so now it's actually just refers to a template. But I believe and the secure team owns the, the job template. And then you know, the auto DevOps team owns the orchestration around it. I'd love to see the release thing happen as well. So they are now looking at Terraform as a way to do deploys as part of configuration. But honestly, like maybe that should be released because it's, it's all about release. So yes, it's about how to configure a release, but it's all about release. I, anyway, so in the interest of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so, sorry. Um, I was just sort of curious. I, I think this is kind of what you're getting at, but um, has, has the idea of, of sort of like a, a plug-in architecture ever been talked about? Like, I, I just spent two days at a, at a conference talking to a, a, a bunch of folks. Um, I was actually working in the GitLab booth there, and they were all talking about, um, can you deploy to Terraform? Can you deploy to Elastic Beanstalk? Um, like, all of these things. And, like, just other random stuff, too. And, it feels like all of like the the destination of of code in, in from the release you know is is going to like a million different places um if if we had some sort of like you know maybe it's a template like you're describing but something where we can say like hey if you want to do elastic beanstalk here's like here's how you can contribute and build your own like hook for that so maybe we don't have to build it we get someone that or, or it, we make it easy just to build something and then and then like those those like deploy endpoints can be, you know, it can be Kubernetes and, and Terraform, but then like a bunch of other stuff that is maybe more legacy that, that we wouldn't really want to spend the time to build, but it becomes more accessible. Yeah, I think that, I hope that the Terraform effort will make it a lot easier to cover a ton of different deploy targets, but like, yeah, I don't know, like is Elastic Beanstalk included there? I don't know, or would we include that? I'm not exactly sure how that would even work. Um, like from our perspective, do we provide the Terraform scripter? Like sure, you could always provide your own that would deploy to Elastic Beanstalk, but then that's just as painful, right? At any rate, um, there is a recent update to the handbook somewhere uh, that you should all probably read. <laughs> uh, it's kind of important, um, but it basically says, we will try to avoid plugins sort of almost at all cost. Um, and the reason for that is Jenkins basically, because it's a nightmare. Uh, Jenkins, it's one of the biggest reasons that Jenkins, the people want to leave Jenkins. Um, administering the plugins, incompatible plugins, plugins getting stale, all these things, like it's just, it's really horrible. I totally get that it's easier, it's less effort. It's less effort at least for the company behind Jenkins but it's not less effort collectively you know, across the universe. Um, in fact, it's more effort. Um, there's just a lot of downsides to using plugins. So we are actively trying to take a different approach and say, look, we're open source. You can contribute stuff. If you need an Elastic Beanstalk deployment thing, like contribute it directly in somewhere, but then it's in the product and it will be maintained, it will be tested. Um, when we update versions, whatever, we will make sure it's there. It's very, very different than plugins. And Jason and I were having this conversation yesterday too. There seems to be a massive difference between like, like modules are not inherently bad. Like NPM registry and, uh, uh, you know, Ruby gems and whatever, like these things all succeed. And, and the only thing I can, that I came up with yesterday anyway, was that 
Like, but those modules tend to have like tests and they're maintained. And there's a certain amount of um, like not interdependent interdependence. Like you, you use a module and it does exactly what it says it does. And it's really small, sharp tool. Whereas somehow plugins just are super brittle. There's no test harness for them usually. Um, so when, when you upgrade the version, like you just some number of you know, plugins are just randomly going to break. And then, you know, with Jenkins, like they make Jenkins core, then it's like, oh, these are the ones that we're going to test. So if you're using those, those are, those are blessed. And our answer is generally like, if, if those are important plugins, they should just be part of the product. They shouldn't be plugins. So that's our approach. It has consequences. It means that we don't have as much stuff covered. The flip side though, is that like deploying your Elastic Beanstalk is easy. Like it's a bash script. Like one of the awesome things about CI and CD, the way we do it anyway, is like, it's actually really trivial to make that stuff happen. You can still have a blog post that says, here's how you deploy to anywhere. And you just got to copy and paste. Um, even if we use templates and everything else underneath, it's like just a bash script that's running. You don't need a plugin to make that happen. I will say though, I'm on board with exploring more by using templates and, um, and, and especially within the context of auto DevOps and saying, well, like, what if I wanted to deploy somewhere else? Could I like include auto DevOps and then like include the Elastic Beanstalk deployer? And that just redefines the job. And then boom, that's where it's going to go. Maybe even going farther, you could, if it's common enough, we could push it in auto DevOps that it would detect that, oh, you've got Elastic Beanstalk credentials. We will then just go ahead and deploy for you because we know how to deploy. But that's actually even better than like having to manually configure things. Um, but the point is that um, I think we can do that with includes. We do have to be really careful about sort of recreating plugins, right? Um, but we can certainly experiment with that because it's a nice MVC. I'd love to see, and I think I know this is possible when my exploration a long time ago was like, oh, here's an auto DevOps thing where like, oh, here's the deploy to Kubernetes and then, oh, here's the deployment to EC2. And it's just, you include a different thing and that just redefines the deploy job and it knows how to deploy there. Like that would be really easy to do. Um, and I, I think, yes, we should absolutely explore that. I, I think that's a really good point about like the testing uh, and, the, and the quality of those things. Cause um, if, you, if you sort of like crowdsource them, then the, the, there's just such a wide array of quality and, um, and then like support lifetime. So that totally makes sense. It really is tough. And so uh, one of the other reasons this is, comes up a lot is like GitHub Actions is kind of going down that path. But even before that, like Drone IO um, has a, a plugin architecture and, and a bunch of folks do where their architecture is basically like, oh, make a, make a Docker image. And then we just execute that Docker image. And if you want to behave differently, you give it different environment variables and it just behaves differently. And that sounds great like oh i just need this package thing and it'll just do whatever i need for it but like as soon as you're like oh but it turns out it does this thing and it's slightly weird and it names the directories this and i need the next directory meaning that and then you're like oh now how do i change that and like oh no problem just fork the docker image and like what now i need to learn docker and i need to know docker files like i was just doing ci and i could have copied a bash script now you're telling me i have to figure this other stuff out now maybe we're at a point where learning docker files syntax is not that hard and everybody's doing it anyway. And so it's all totally fine, but still there's this opaqueness. Like, how do I know what it's even doing? Like, it's just a Docker image. I can't even see what it's doing. So I have been in favor of, no, like here's the script. And even the way that we did um, auto DevOps, it's like, it is literally a GitLab CI YAML file that you can look at. And it's got a bunch of includes and you can look at all those. It makes it a little bit more obfuscated because the multi-level includes, but they're all there. You can see exactly what it's doing. If you want to customize it, you just customize it. And they're not particularly complex. So if you wanted to change the deploy thing, like it should be relatively easy. But having said that, you know, the composable auto DevOps idea came around a long, long time ago. We are moving a lot slower this way and plugins, we might've made a lot more progress. We might have, a hundred different deploy targets by now if we had just done this other thing, but, but there's clearly the flip side of like, yeah, but then we might be, you know, Jenkins, you know, a repeat. Anyway, so in the interest of time, I kind of want to, I do want to get through a few of my items, but I, I would love for people to still jump in. If you're inspired by anything, feel free to add any other comments. And I'll try to keep mine short because they're already written down so you can read them. Um, I actually just talked about, uh, L is composable, uh, um, oh, actually, I think all of these are exactly the same thing. GitHub Actions, uh, Deployment Recipes, uh, Composable Auto DevOps, stuff we just covered. Um, M 
it's going to make it easy to deploy different types of targets uh, in the same project. And that actually might be easy, uh, as Jason pointed out, like you've got environment, sp or environment specific variables. And so uh, like if you've got a script that says like, oh, you've got e EC2 credentials, we must be deploying to EC2. Well, just make sure that you only give EC2 credentials to the job that needs EC2 credentials. Don't give them to your whole project. Um, that might be one way to do it. But from an include perspective, it might get more complicated because we don't, you can't sort of just include into a job. But anyway, keep that in mind when we're designing it. Build packs, something I want to kind of talk about. Um, and this gets a little bit convoluted because it's not strictly released, like builds happen in the verify stage. But the other way to look at it is if I'm trying to do continuous deployments, I need to deploy something and I need to deploy that build. And, um, and verify, a lot of times people are like making a build that's needed for testing, but that might be different than the build that's actually used for production. And so I feel like we need to, we need to at least have an opinion on how to do build packs and stuff. Oh yeah, I should have put a URL. Um, I'm really interested in buildpacks.io that you are, it's cloud native build packs um, and it's got potential. The really quick sort of downsides for me though, is it still oriented around Heroku um, where they do obviously CD, but for example, they don't do security testing. So the build pack has no concept of security testing. Well, wouldn't it be cool if a build pack also knew how to do security testing too? It was a language specific thing. That's the point. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a build pack anymore. Like build pack is underselling what the point is. Um, but we could also look at that and say, well, hey, can we contribute back? Can we, you know, so build packs um, originally only had sort of like three functions and you know, like it was detect what language it is and then build the language and then release the language, or, sorry, release the package, um, you know, by combining variables into it. And then they added a fourth, which is to be able to test it um because they added ci at heroku um but like yeah the security testing code quality and all that kind of stuff doesn't happen um and then i feel like there might be a couple other pieces that are missing but the thing is like could we contribute to that i'd rather invest in an open source project and make it better and so can we add a fifth and sixth need um if that's you know if we can if not we may have to look at other things, but I would love us to still solve that collectively. This is where, again, it might not be the release team that needs to do this, but in order to do CDRA, I think this is kind of what we can't just count on Docker files as the way that people build stuff. Um, manual actions. O here. Um, I think this, I'm just trying to get at that. Like um, we have manual actions today and people do use them, but we don't make it easy to use them right. Like if I don't have permissions to do a deploy or don't have, you know, not necessarily like actually restricted permissions, but I'm not the right person to deploy. I have to go in like in Slack, say, Hey, okay. Uh, I merged this into product into master. It's deployed to staging. Can somebody else deploy it to production or something like that? But like, shouldn't there should be some other way that you get notified about this? Like, I could maybe even from the UI be like, okay, make the request. And then somebody else gets the automated notification. Like I shouldn't have to know who even is authorized to do it. The system should just know who the deploy, the release manager is, all that kind of stuff. Um, we also have things like uh, security reviews and audits and whatnot. And, and so now we have this thing where some a, a pipeline can be blocked by security review if you know, vulnerability is found but like we don't actually notify the security team. We just sort of block it. And it's like, well, that kind of sucks. So I feel like there's some stuff to do with manual um, actions and that definitely fits into the release automation part. Um, yeah, so general question P here is like, what does it take to get to the top right of, I happen to reference uh, Cloud B's URL, but it's the Forrester wave. Um, and this again was noticing that uh, like all the top right are legacy companies, but still, what does it take? What do they have that we're missing? Uh, hopefully, you know, Jason, you were involved, so you have a better answer to that. But I'd love to see that factored into our three-year vision. And, and again, in order to sort of achieve our vision here, we, we need to be top right next time somebody does a report like this, so we better have an answer. Um, but as I mentioned, I think that I am more worried about Spinnaker than I am CA Technologies or Electric Cloud. I should have shared this link earlier. Um, 
uh, but it just came to me with, with what you were saying, Mark. Um, the, uh, we actually have a page that's a direct response to the CDRA uh, analyst report. Um, I'll put that down here at the bottom. Yeah, I know, and I should have put the link in there too. I know it does exist, so we've got an answer to that. I'm just saying that it's not you know, in the strategy doc, so therefore it doesn't exist <laughs> from a yeah, strategy. Yeah, exactly, it, and it should. Uh, but, and, and also we're just finishing another CDRA. Cycle. I know, I know. Anyone will come out. We'll review the results and that will feed into the, this page as well as the roadmap. Yeah, cool. Um, so Q, the zero touch, just kind of, well, one thing in the doc, like the related epics don't do it just, I think zero touch is really important. Um, and, and just to make sure, I think I phrased it a while ago as like, a, you know, there's like the one click deploy thing. And then that's pretty awesome. I should just be able to one click deploy and we know exactly how to deploy. But really it should just be zero click deploy. It's like I pushed up my code and a couple minutes later, it's running in production. Like it should be zero click. I assume that's a lot around the zero touch. Like I don't have to configure anything. I don't have to specify it. But in terms of this doc, when I look at the related epics, it's just totally uninspiring for what that actually means, I think. So I don't know if we need more epics or we just need better examples or something. Um, but, uh, but the part of that doc needs some work. Um, sorry, I lost my window. Uh, oh, quick, do we want to mention GitOps? I don't know that I actually really want to prioritize GitOps, but in the three-year vision, I think we should definitely talk about it. We should have an opinion about whether we think GitOps is going to succeed or not. Um, and really, really quickly, like, uh, I think that there's, um, we are, <laughs> We're definitely biased towards doing part of GitOps, meaning I merged a master and it should either cause a deployment to staging or production. Like that's totally true. And then, but right now we say, but if it's to staging, well then it's a manual action to deploy to production because I believe that's one of the most common paths. But there is another path, which is, okay, no, and now it's deployed to staging, great. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tag that as a release and, and, and then push up the tag, and the, the addition of the tag should now cause it to go to production. That's a, one part, one aspect of GitOps. And, and I think that is actually part of our uh, GitLab flow that we describe on one of the pages. I don't know if Auto DevOps actually works that way or not. It probably should. Uh, but anyway, we should definitely have some opinion about we should support it probably. I don't know what priority GitOps comes into. Um, but there may be other aspects. That's obviously one little simple sliver. But the idea is that like all manual actions disappear, right? And everything should be Git operations. Um, I don't know, honestly, if I even really care about that because the manual actions aren't so bad as long as they're audited and they're 100% automated. Like meaning once I click it, all the actions afterwards are automated. That's super critical. But I don't know that it's super critical that it's a tag or a branch based operation instead of a manual click. Um, and then there's also chat ops, um, which is another factor, um, which totally in a different direction. Uh, I have some things against. I, I don't think it's taking off nearly as much as people thought it would. Um, but also part of that, uh, really, really interesting. We don't have to go in time to go into, but the idea that chat ops is actually sort of a bug. In fact, chat is almost sort of a bug. It's not a bug. That's the wrong way. It's just exceptions. Like. Chat is there for all the kind of conversation that can't happen where, there was, where they would have been better off to have happen. Like, and so then there's this interesting thing about like in our deployments and stuff like that, like I should be able to just comment on a deployment. I should be able to involve people. I, I should be able to do something. And just like I was talking about like, oh, the fact that I need a manual, I need somebody else to manually approve something. I should somehow be able to request that in the UI. If I have to go to chat to tell somebody, hey, can you click on this manual approval? Like that's because it's an exception. And there's a really interesting argument to make for we should make our product such that all the conversation happens at the moment where it needs to happen and not use the exception. And if you go down that path, then chat ops sort of, it's, it's like you don't want to do your ops in chat. It's like you want to do your chat in ops. Anyway, really too long conversation to go into. But uh, anyway, that was all my items. Um, anything else anybody want to add? Come on, I know you all have some opinions. What's important here? Um, Mark, you touched on this, but I'm really interested in your uh, point F about providing auto DevOps for 
Kubernetes, but providing it for, or sorry, but provide, we don't provide anything outside of Kubernetes. Um, the, I know we touched on that a bunch, but that's an interesting topic to me, um, just to dealing with deployments like Google App Engine, for example, in the past and how uh, you cr basically you're driving your outside of Kubernetes, you're driving your automatic scaling through an app YAML file and how typically the flow would be to store all of those, um, all those parameters inside of your environment variables. And then your CI script creates the app YAML file out uh, in, in your, in your branch when that's being deployed. So that could be a neat thing. Um, it seems like we could probably easily create templates around that stuff. So that conversation just had my wheels turning um, just to throw that out there. Cool. So I'll actually add two more things there. One is that, yes, um, I really do think that Auto DevOps should have uh, support for other than Kubernetes. Um, it, we should just have it, like, even to the extent of like, oh, um, you know, you added the AWS uh, EC2 integration. So we detected EC2 credentials. Therefore, we just know what to do. Like you've given us the whatever, the, not just the credentials, but the location or identifiers you need, and, and off we go. Um, but then there was a second thing, uh, variables. Um, and this is, um, this is sort of a weird topic. I don't know if I'll have time to go into, to make it do justice, but um, right now we store like scale information. If you want to scale your application, there's a, an environment variable for it. I don't remember actually, I don't think we ever shipped this, but there was a huge conversation around, we wanted to have a button to say like, oh, I just want to up the scale. I want to bump it up, you know, whatever. And like Heroku makes it super easy, just scale up the dynos. It's literally a slider, just slide it to the thing and then it goes and uh, you know, you hit run or whatever you, the button and it goes and scales it. And like we should be just that easy. But then I think the implementation got a little weird because it added that mechanism, but like it had a different storage mechanism for it. I'm like, well then wait a minute, but we've got these variables to do it. We also got the slider. And then what makes it really problematic is that Kubernetes also has a, a concept of scale. So if I go into the Kubernetes dashboard or the you know, kubectl, and I, I can just change the scale there, and that works, except it doesn't work, because then the next time we do a deploy, it like resets the scale, because we've got a variable that says deploy it to 10, let's say 10 pods, and I set that to 12 one day, and then I do another deploy, it's going to go back to 10, because we've hard, we've not hard coded, but we've passed that variable down, and so um, figuring all that stuff out is really weird. And what we just tell people right now is like, well, just don't use the dashboard. You have to, like, if you're deploying via GitLab, you have to use GitLab. There's a really interesting question about like, is that the only way though? Like, what if we made it in a way where, like, no, we actually, like the data is in Kubernetes itself. We do it in a Kubernetes native way. And we use the Kubernetes scale. And then when we, we could still have a slider in the GitLab UI, but when you do that slider, it would actually go and change the cubes, you know, the Kubernetes configuration. And if you could change the configuration in Kubernetes outside, it would actually like literally change the slider, you know, ideally in a real time sort of sense, although it would have to pull, so it would kind of suck. But there's an interesting thing about like, that's just this is one variable, but there's like a whole bunch of other kinds of data. Like, should we put that there? Should we play well with others as others create like an app definition um, and, and there is like a, a, I think it's a app CRD, whatever it is. I don't remember what it's called, but there is a definition that folks like Helm actually, I think was the first one I heard talking about is like, well, when you deploy a Helm app, it's actually going to create this record in Kubernetes to represent the app. And like, well, shouldn't we have that same artifact? Shouldn't we standardize on that for a while? It's like, well, nobody else is using it. So who cares if Helm is the only one then it's not really relevant, but what if everybody does embrace that? What if the world embraces this concept? not just about the scale, but other aspects of the app. And should we then use that as data? So of course, the farther we go down that path, the harder it is to then support other things because like, oh, well, all the stuff, all the work we do about making the data stay in Kubernetes, we don't get the value for Terraform or something. But this is actually sort of a strategic risk for us. Um, Jenkins X, I, I'll say it, it's a public recorded thing here, but there's a lot of things that Jenkins has done that I've not understood, uh, not agreed with, whatever. Jenkins X was one of the first things in a very long time, at least, where I'm like, wow, I really respect what they're doing there. They're actually sort of doing the hard thing and saying, let's try to make this, you know, you can't technically make it Kubernetes native, but maybe you can make it Kubernetes immigrant, whatever. Um, 
you can like say, well, let's push the data into Kubernetes and then let's start embracing things in a Kubernetes native way so that we really play well with all the other ecosystem of the Kubernetes tools. And I don't know how the hell they're gonna reconcile that with the rest of Jenkins, but they're, they're trying. And I feel like we're sort of a hybrid in between where we're not quite willing to completely commit to Kubernetes, but yet we're doing Kubernetes first, but we're doing other things also. And so we're not really willing to put the data in Kubernetes, but then there is this risk of, okay, but then if there is this big ecosystem of stuff that comes together, will we end up making our product not play well with others? Like, oh, well, once you again, well, you deploy it with Kubernetes, you cannot use the, the Kubernetes dashboard. Sorry, you deploy with GitLab to Kubernetes. You can't use the Kubernetes dashboard. You can't use any other tools to manage it. You have to use ours. And like, well, then great. We better do a really good job of making that administration amazing. But like, what if we don't? Or what if there's just some other need where somebody needs a Kubernetes tool and we don't, and they don't understand it? Totally, that could be a really, really hard conversation. But again, I think it's something that probably should factor into a three-year strategy discussion. I think it's too early to say, and, and I will actually just state my opinion on this is that we, we don't jump to Kubernetes native. We wait and see if this ecosystem doesn't manifest, we don't need to help create it. Um, I do believe that GitLab is the, the one control plane that we need to worry about. Um, and ultimately, I want GitLab to evolve to a point where you don't ever need to do the Kubernetes dashboard or kubectl for that matter. That like literally everything you needed to do can be done within GitLab. But that doesn't mean that there isn't potentially some you know, ecosystem of really important things that start rallying around a few different custom resource definitions and we should embrace those. And when that happens, we will, I guess is the answer. All right, um, well, we are basically out of time. Um, we didn't get to the convergent thinking part where we sort of distill it down from big three-year stuff down to one-year stuff. I think I'm sort of okay with that because I don't feel like in other conversations it was a lot more important to do that because there were definitely like some really big things that we need to say no to the first year. Anyway, we can. I, I'm also happy to have a follow-on conversation if we want to do there. Maybe we can start async. Um and try and fill that section out async and then see what appears and uh, if we need a follow-up conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think like we talked before, I'd love to see just at a really high level, three years, what are all sort of the, the important things that we can talk about and then make the decision and you ultimately um, need to make the decision about like this is what we're gonna do in the year. And then, you know, I'd, I'd wanna vet that and make sure that that sounds appropriate and that what we're saying no to sounds right, but, um, I think that won't be too hard here. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, again, please do, uh, you know, we'll continue to talk about this. We can iterate on this again. And also feel free to give me any feedback on the process itself. Um, was this useful? Did this help at all? Did it just create more confusion? Whatever. Um, we're going to do a few more of these things. So uh, let's continue to iterate on the process itself. Really cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I agree. This was really, really fun. Thanks.